Colossians chapter 1. We've been on a series called Jesus is Worth. And we've been looking at uh, different things that we consider values of this church. Um, and uh, different things that we believe should be the culture of this church and the value of this church. And uh, we, we talked a, a number of different things. Well, let's just read this scripture first. In Colossians 1, verse 9, I'm reading from the New King James. It says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of of the Lord. Somebody say, walk worthy of the Lord. And then it says, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Does the Lord want you to be fruitful? Yes. He wants us to be fruitful. That means we're productive in our Christian walk. Amen. And this is how the Father is glorified. Jesus said that my Father is glorified when you bear much fruit. And so when we're fruitful, the Lord is glorified. And being fruitful is how we please the Lord. And that occurs when we're walking worthy of him. We're talking about walking worthy of the Lord, living a life that is worthy of what he has called us. Uh, in Ephesians, you don't have to turn there, but Ephesians 4, verse 1, Paul, the apostle says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. To walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And so the Lord has called us. He's called us many things in the word of God. We're his children, we're his ambassadors, we're his soldiers, and we're to walk worthy of of what he's called us. Amen. We're to live a life that pleases him, that he looks at us and uh, he says, you are a worthy representative of me. You are a worthy ambassador of me, of my son and of what we've done. Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, if you were going to pick somebody, if you were an important person, well, we're all important, but I mean an important as far as in the a, you know, government of men, you were some type of political high up official or a higher CEO in a company or something, and you were looking for somebody to represent you to, uh, you know, a different country, to a different organization, you would want to find somebody that was worthy of the standards and the values of your organization and of yourself. Amen. Amen. I mean, well, the father's doing the same thing. He wants us to walk worthy of who he is and what he has called us to be and of who we are. And so we're talking about Jesus is worth. And what we said previous weeks, he's worth my fight. We fight for the things he's bought and paid for. We don't quit. Jesus fought for us. He fought for those things. He sacrificed himself for those things. So we are willing to fight for those things. We fight for one another. We fight with each other. Amen. We don't let our brother and sister just fall, you know, victim to the enemy's attacks. No, we fall and we fight with them. Amen. We lift them up and we help them fight. We help them fight the good fight of faith. That's what a church family is supposed to be. You're supposed to come and say, hey, believe with me. Help me fight this fight. Amen. And we talked about Jesus is worth my love. And uh, we said that uh, we are talking in John, what is it, 14, 21. Jesus said, if you love me, you obey my commandments, and then the Father will make himself more real. He'll manifest himself. Uh, Jesus is worth our love. He is worth our obedience, and our obedience uh, and our love for him is demonstrated in our obedience to do his word. And then that's how he becomes more real to us, when we obey him. Amen. And then we love one another. Something Now, all these subjects, I can go, we can basically, everything that we've talked about so far, we could spend a series talking about each one of those things. And at some point, we probably will. You know, because love is the New Testament commandment. We'll probably spend months on that at some point, talking about the love of God uh, and uh, what the love of God means. But we are, that is the, the New Testament commandment, to love one another. 
And that is how people will know that we are his disciples is our love for each other, is our love for one another. And so we said this during pre-service prayer before we pray. Sometimes we'll cover some things. But we said there is to be no strife in this church. There is to be zero strife in church. That means we don't tolerate strife. We don't tolerate arguing and bickering. No, there's not to be any of that because when we allow strife, that is like saying, here, devil, come on in. That's like opening that door and saying, devil, come on in and let him have his way in this place. Because the Bible says where there's envy and strife, there's confusion in every evil work. So strife is the manifest presence of the devil. Sometimes, you know, we're praying for things, Lord, you know, heal my body, do, heal, you know, work in my finances. Well, sometimes you have to look at, is there strife? Is there an open door somewhere? Yeah. There's things that you just, you know, we just can't have blanket prayer sometimes. We have to go to the Lord and, Lord, show us if there's any place in our lives where we have an open door to the enemy so that he can cause this havoc. Right? The Bible says the enemy is walking around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He just can't devour anybody. He has to have an open door. He has to have access. So we talked about that. We talked about Jesus is worth my gratitude and he is worth my honor. We talked about that last week. So if you didn't um, see those, hear those, go ahead and catch up uh, with us online. But let's go to this next one. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Now, the book of Galatians was addressed to a group of churches, not just one church, but it was addressed to a group of churches. And what the Apostle Paul or the Lord through the Apostle Paul is dealing with is legalism has gotten into the church. And it was through a group of people called the Judaizers. The Judaizers were a mixture of ethnic Jews and Gentiles that believed that they should keep the legal demands of the law, of the old covenant, and the Jewish, old Jewish customs. And so they believed they should keep those demands, and they were proclaiming that Gentiles really that the promises were to the Jews and that Gentiles needed to still keep the demands of the law. They needed to be circumcised in order for them to earn justification. So these Judaizers are in there and they're spreading this false doctrine. And and through the Apostle Paul was the revelation that, no, it's by grace through faith. Because of what Jesus did, we don't have to do all these rituals they did to earn salvation, to earn justification, to earn being right with God. Jesus did it for us, and now we receive it. And so he is saying, though, that even though we have been made free from the legal demands of the law, that doesn't mean we are free from everything. And he goes on to explain what that is. In Galatians 5, verse 13, he says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an occasion for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So we have been made free, he says. We've been made free in Christ. But being made free does not mean we are free to do whatever we want now. That does not mean we are free to live a life of self-indulgence. We are not just to live a life that just caters and serves our flesh now and just does whatever the flesh wants to do. We are not free to just gratify or satisfy the desires of the flesh. No, we are free to do what? To serve one another, it says. We are free to serve one another. So that's what we're talking about today. Jesus is worth my service. Somebody say, Jesus Jesus. is worth my service. Now, this is how you identify, too, when something is false doctrine, okay? If 
Some teaching out there is proclaiming and saying that you can do whatever you want because we're under grace and we've been made free because of what Jesus did. And that means that now you can just live a life that caters to the flesh and that's a life of self-indulgence and you can do whatever the flesh feels like doing whenever you want to do it. That's error. That's how you know, no, the Bible talks about we should walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, when you hear the word flesh, don't only think sexual, immoral sins. Don't think immorality. Lust of the flesh could mean you just oversleep all the time. You just yield to your flesh. You give in to your flesh. You watch too much TV. You have too much entertainment time. Your fl- that doesn't mean you can't sleep, okay? That doesn't mean you can't uh, have some times of entertainment. But when it's too much, when you should be doing something else and you're only doing what the flesh wants to do, that is living a life of self-indulgence, okay? No, the Lord didn't free us so that we can just serve the flesh, He didn't free us just so that we can say, hey, we're free now. The Lord freed us. Thank you, Lord. And that means all I have to do now is just relax, kick my feet up, and do nothing now. No, that's not what the freedom is for. Our freedom is to do something with it. We are free to serve. We've been given a freedom to serve. I know that sounds like a contradiction in our American culture, You know, we think freedom, free to do what we want. I'm free to say what I want to say. I'm free to do what I want to do, go to where I want to go. Well, as a Christian, you are free, but your freedom is to do something. You are free to do something with that freedom. You're not just free so you can just live a selfish life. You are free to serve somebody. You are free to serve one another. That's what we have been given a freedom and a liberty to do. Amen? See, when you love your brother and sister, when you love others, you want to serve them. There's going to be a demonstration. You're going to show I love you by what you do. There's going to be something you do. You serve them. Yeah, you've been free. Yeah, you can do what you want to do. We, you know, you, we can do what we want to do. The Lord has given us a willing, uh, a freedom of choice. He says, hey, I paid the price for you. I've done, I've saved you, I've redeemed you from the curse. Now here, you can serve me if you want to. He doesn't force us. But if we're smart, we'll say, thank you, Lord. I want to serve you. I want to live for you. And we'll do it willingly and gladly from the heart because that's the only way he accepts it. And the Apostle Paul is saying, no, we don't just use our freedom to just live the way we want. We use our freedom to serve one another. You want to assist someone else. And our motivation is motivated out of love. Let me read that same uh, verse in the Amplified. It says, for you, brethren, were indeed called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom be an incentive to your flesh and an opportunity or excuse for selfishness. But through love, you should serve one another. You see that we're not free to just cater to the flesh, do whatever the flesh wants. That's not why the Lord made us free. He's saying, hey, now use your freedom to serve somebody else. See, in the old covenant, you were in some ways, you were bound to do all these things to just make yourself right. But now in the new covenant, we're free from that. So now we can help somebody else. We're not just concerned about us anymore being right. We can help somebody else. We can be a blessing to somebody else. Amen. The CEV of that same verse says, my friends, you were chosen to be free. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do anything you want. Use it as an opportunity to serve each other with love. Notice the motivation. It's love. Love is the motivation. We're serving because we love. We're serving one another because we love each other and we love the Lord. That's our motivation. Now, we have to renew our mind to see this and to think the way the Lord sees this. Because I'm free to serve my brother and sister. I'm free to serve another person. 
We have to think like the Lord thinks and see this the way he sees this. Go with me to Romans chapter 12. Somebody say, Jesus is worth my service. Jesus is worth my service. Romans chapter 12. Yeah, it is a bit frosty in here, huh? All right, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says, I beseech you. I said Romans 12, correct? Yes. Romans 12, 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service reasonable service if you look up that word service in the greek that's what the new testament was written in if you look up that word service that is the same word that's also translated worship so when you hear the word service you think worship okay when you hear worship you think service so say that with me say service, service. Equals, worship. equals worship worship, worship equal service. Okay? So they're interchangeable. The Amplified says it this way, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice. Somebody say living sacrifice. Holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Do you see that? It's worship and service. So in light of all these mercies, all the things that the Lord has done for us, and him becoming the sacrifice for us, and him laying down his life for us, we ought to be a living sacrifice. And when we are a living sacrifice, when we present our bodies, ourselves, our lives, as a living sacrifice, the Lord receives it as worship. Amen. Worship. Somebody say worship. worship. You know, worship is not just lifting your hands. It's not just getting on your knees and saying, Lord, I love you. You know, something that I've noticed in our American church culture, especially with the rise of, you know, Christian artists, and I'm not knocking Christian artists or anything like that. You know, one of my best friends is a Christian artist, and we sang his song actually at the end there, Jesus the Sinner. But um, something that I've noticed is that, you know, it's easy to come into a place, especially when the lights are dim and there's, you know, flashing lights and there's smoke machines and it's dark and the music is jumping and it's a great vocalist singing. It's easy to just get into that environment. Oh, and I worship you. And that's great. That's great to worship the Lord. But is that always a sacrifice? Is that always a sacrifice? If you look up this word sacrifice, when you look at the word sacrifice, and if you look it up in a Strong's Concordance, and I recommend you get a Strong's Concordance, look up these words. Don't just, don't just take what I'm saying and say, oh, he said it, so that's, that's what it is. No, look it up for yourself so you can see what I'm saying is the truth. But that word sacrifice is also the word, the definition you'll see is victim. Victim. And I never saw this as clear until... I was looking at this, but anytime there is a sacrifice, for it to be a sacrifice, there is a victim involved. There is an innocent victim. Under the old covenant, under the law, when the priests, the ministers of that day, of that time, would offer a sacrifice for the sins of the people, it was an innocent animal. That became the victim. Do you see that? That became the victim for the sins of the people. Why? Because the Bible says without, you know, well, first of all, it says the wages of sin is death. And without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. So something had to be the sacrificial victim, the sacrificial lamb. The sin of the people had to be transferred to this animal and that became the victim that became the sacrifice so if there is no victim involved there's really no sacrifice 
If there is nothing innocent that is dying, if there is nothing that is dying, if there's no victim, then is it really a sacrifice? You see that. It says, what does it say, Romans 12? It says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Now, in this new covenant, you know, Jesus, he came and he became the once and for all sacrifice. What does that mean? He became the innocent victim. He became the victim for our sins. And he became the sacrificial lamb, the innocent sacrificial victim once and for all. So we don't have to offer animal sacrifices anymore. We don't have to kill anything with a sword or anything and offer something on the altar per se. But now we are to be a living sacrifice. So how do we do that? That means something in our lives has to be the victim. That means something has to die in order for it to be a true sacrifice. Because if there is no victim happening anywhere in our lives, is it really a sacrifice? If we are not dying to something, what we want to do, and what I'm talking about is dying to the flesh. If we are not saying the flesh, me wanting to sleep in today, this is going to be the victim because I'm going to get up, get to church, and I'm going to serve my brother and sister. I'm going to serve the Lord. If that doesn't happen, then how is there any sacrifice involved? That means there's no worship involved. Do you see that? Because for, in order for it to be true worship and true service, there has to be something that died. There has to be something that became a victim in our lives. So when you know that, hey, I'm on the schedule to serve the Lord today, but man, I, re I really want to watch that football game because it's coming on. Well, that football game becomes the victim. And you say, no, I'm not doing this. I am sacrificing this so I can offer up my body as a living sacrifice to the Lord. See, a sacrifice, a real sacrifice in the new covenant is when you say, I'm willing to put this down, my flesh under what it wants to do. I'm willing to die to this so that I can offer up a reasonable worship to the Lord, reasonable service to the Lord. Do you see that? In order for something in this new covenant to be sacrificial, something had to die. Somewhere along the way, something is becoming a victim to the worship. Do you guys, are you guys tracking with me? You guys seeing that, right? Let me read these, let me read these scriptures here so they can see, you can see a little bit clearer what I'm talking about. Galatians 5, 24, you don't have to turn there. It says, those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So when your flesh wants to do something and you know, no, I, I can't do this right now. You know, now we can, this can cover a, a broad range of things. We can talk about doing something immoral and wrong with the flesh, something sexually immoral. Or, we, or it could be as simple as just wanting to oversleep, wanting to stay in the bed when you know you should be getting up and, and, and serving somebody, doing something for somebody. That, one of those things has to be the victim. One of those things has to be crucified. If it's going to be acceptable to the Lord, if it's going to be true spiritual worship to the Lord. Romans 8.12 says this, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Do you see how your flesh, what you want to do, has to die? Now, we're not talking about literally taking a knife and stabbing yourself so the flesh is dead. But there has to be, you, you know, in your own life, if you really don't want to go to work and you have to be at work at a certain time, you have to be at work at 7 a.m. in the morning, well, you have to die to what your flesh wants to do, right? It has to be the victim. You're like, I really want to sleep in right now. But the right thing to do is not just call in and say I'm sick when I'm not, because that would be dishonest. So I'm going to die to what I want to do. My flesh becomes the victim, and I get up and do what I'm supposed to do. Do you see that? Yes. 
In order for it to be a sacrifice, there has to be a victim. I never saw that as clear as until yesterday studying this. I said, oh, my Lord. And now I should, the Lord helped me to see that clear. He helped me to see that because, yes, I know in a sacrifice there's a victim, but our flesh is now the victim in this new covenant. That is how we become a living sacrifice. We crucify the flesh and what it wants to do. Because if there was no victim, was there really a sacrifice? Now, in this new covenant, we don't have a priest or a minister offering sacrifices on our behalf. In this new covenant, we are priests, the Bible says. The Bible says that we have been made living stones. You as living stones and holy priesthood, we are to offer up spiritual sacrifices to the Lord that are acceptable to him. Through Jesus Christ. So there are some things that would not be acceptable and there are things that would be acceptable. So we are to offer up something acceptable now to the Lord. And that is when we die. We die to what we want to do. And that is our ministry. Our ministry is off to offer to the Lord service. And he receives it as worship. When we sacrificially serve the Lord, when we sacrificially serve his people, he considers that worship. He looks at that as worship. See, that's how you do Galatians 5.13. It says through love you should serve one another. Well, how are you going to do that? Because it says, yeah, you've been made free, but don't use your liberty as a freedom, uh, as an occasion to the flesh. But now through love serve one another. Well, how are you going to do that? You're going to have to die to what you want to do with your free self and do what you should do and serve one another. Do you see that? Your flesh says, man, I'm free to do what I want. But no, when you love the Lord, you say, no, I'm free to serve his people. That's what I'm going to do. And a lot of times it will be sacrificial. Right? We have some biblical examples of sacrificial service. Uh, in Acts 15, don't, you don't have to turn there, but as a testimony of the character of Paul and Barnabas, a letter of commendation from the council at Jerusalem was sent to a group of churches, and it was to, to commend the character and integrity of Paul and Barnabas. And it said this, that these were men who risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's Acts 15:26. They risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What were they doing? They were serving his people. They were ministering to his people. And when they were doing that, what was happening, they were putting their own lives at risk. They were inconveniencing themselves. And they were serving God. They were serving his people. Do you see that? Something had to die, though. Yeah. Their inconvenience, the things they wanted to do, that had to die. That had to become the victim to now serve the Lord. You see that? Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 12, 15, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Do you see that? I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. He is willing to spend himself for them. That's true service. That's and the Lord receives that as worship. The NIV says, so I will very gladly spend for you everything I have and expend myself as well. Do you hear that? See, Paul's motivation, I could use a little bit more help in here. Paul's motivation was not some sort of twisted, you know, gratification that he got from suffering and dealing with some pain. No, his motivation was love for other people. That was his motivation. It was motivated out of God's love for other people. And you hear the sacrifice in that, right? They risked their lives for the name of their Lord, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was willing to spend and be spent. And this kind of sacrifice makes us useful to the kingdom of God. When we are willing to serve another person, that makes you useful. Because what else would you be doing with your freedom then if you're not serving somebody? If you're not serving somebody, who are you serving? You're just serving yourself, what you want to do, right? I'm just going to lay in the bed. I'm going to sleep in. You know, they don't need no help at the church, you know. They got help. No, you're serving yourself, right? If you never do anything, right? 
I mean, the Lord saved us. He anointed us. He graced us. He gave us anointings and giftings. Not so we can just say, woo, woo, woo. I'm anointed. I'm graced. I'm gifted. Woo, and I'm on my way to heaven. Woo, just so we can say, listen to my revelation. Woo, I'm spiritual. Listen to me. This is, no. He saved us and he freed us so that we can serve one another. So that we can use our gifts and our talents to serve one another. Aren't you glad that this morning when you came in here, you didn't have to be concerned that there was gum on your chairs, that there was gum wrappers and there was all kind of lint and things. You know why? Because somebody is taking a lint roller to every single one of these chairs in here this morning. Somebody came in here early this morning at 9 a.m. and went to every chair with a lint roller. Aren't you glad that you're not like kicking, you know, dead squirrels and dead roaches out of the way? Because somebody swept in here this morning. And when you go to the bathroom, it's clean and there's not, you know, it's not flooded and there's toilet paper in there. Why? Because somebody was serving you this morning. Somebody was serving you. Somebody was ministering to you. And that's true ministry. That's real ministry. When it blesses somebody else, that's ministry. See, what you're doing right now, you are being served by me. The Holy Ghost is serving you through me. But you are not serving right now. That's not serving. See, we got a lot of people that come to church, they get served, but they never do any serving. See, serving is what you do. You serve other people, and that's ministry. Ministry is not just preaching and praying and speaking in tongues and giving somebody a word and, oh, I got a word for you. And no, Ministry is when it blesses somebody else. Ministry is what did you do for somebody else. That's great you got a revelation, but how does it bless somebody else? You know, it's not for you to just stay at home like, woo, thank you for these revelations, Lord. Oh, I'm so spiritual. Well, what are you doing with those revelations? It better be blessing to somebody. It better be a blessing and encouragement to somebody else. Amen? It's not for you. It's for the body. It's to be a blessing to your family. You know, I heard a story about a lady, uh, a minister, a pastor. She was uh, at the church praying in the sanctuary and uh, praying for a while and just ministering to the Lord. And she had to, uh, she was there for a while, so she had to use the restroom. She went to the restroom, and when she walked into the restroom, the power of God hit her. The presence of God was in the restroom. And she was like, oh, my Lord. She said, Lord, what is this? She was like, your presence is so strong in this place. I can sense your presence and your love here in the bathroom. We're talking about in the bathroom. And the Lord said to her, Sister Mary was in here cleaning the bathroom unto me. She was in there cleaning. Not, this is not spiritual. This is not preaching from the pulpit. This is not going up to somebody giving a word. She was cleaning the bathroom unto the Lord, and the Lord received it as worship. Have you ever walked into a room where worship has gone on? You sense the presence of God. Well, that doesn't just happen just because we're lifting our hands. That can, all, that can be too easy sometimes. Worship is when somebody is on their hands and knees and they're cleaning the toilet, preparing it for somebody else. That is a blessing to your brother and sister. That is serving the Lord. You are serving somebody else when you do that. Do you hear that? Do you see that? That's true worship. That is true ministry. And you know, this sister Mary that was cleaning the bathroom unto the Lord, she's going to become great in the kingdom of God because nothing is beneath her. She's not too big to do this. She is not too important to do that. And it, it minister to somebody else. Do you see that? Your service can minister to somebody else. It blesses them. Aren't you glad that when you came in here this morning, you're not worried about those things that we talked about. You can just receive and be blessed and be ministered to. Well, somebody else loved you enough to say, I'm going to get here early and minister to my brother and sister. Amen? Amen. Because we can't do it all by ourselves. We had to be here at 5 a.m. to do all that stuff. But somebody here blessed you. Amen? Amen. In Matthew 20:20. 20, 20, uh, you can turn there if you want real quick. Matthew 20, 20. Uh, 
Um, this is uh, the mother of Zebedee's sons. They came to him with her sons. So the mother of Zebedee, Zebedee's sons, came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down, I'm in verse 20, and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine sit on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, you don't know what you, what you ask. You know, sometimes you have to tell people that when they're overstepping their boundaries and asking things they shouldn't ask you. You don't know what you're asking. <laughs> That's not for you to ask me right now. Uh, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? They said to him, we are able. So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. But it is for those for whom it is prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. Notice that the, the rulers, the Gentiles, they exercise authority over. They want authority. They want control. This is the way of our culture today. They want to have superiority over people. They want to be the ones in charge, giving people the instructions and demands and, and telling people what to do. That's the way of the culture. They want to portray this air of superiority. I'm higher than you. My office and my position is on a higher level than yours. I want the corner office with the glass windows overlooking the lake. You cannot have this. This is only for me. It's this air of superiority. Nothing wrong with having an office like that, but if it's so that you can say, look at me, I'm better than you guys. Well, no, that's not, that's not okay. Jesus said in verse 26, it shall not be so among you. He's talking to his disciples. We cannot have that attitude. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give. What did the Son of Man come to do? Serve and to give. His life a ransom for many. Now, who is our example? Je Jesus is our example, right? He's our example. He didn't serve as our substitute. You know, that's the two things that we need to understand. What Jesus did as our substitute and the things that he did as our example. There are certain things he did as our substitute. He bought and paid. He, he laid down his life for our sins. He took the stripes upon his back for our healing as our substitute. He became sin as our substitute. The chastisement or the punishment that would bring us peace, he did that as our substitute, not so that we have to do it. If he did it as our substitute, we don't have to suffer through it. We don't have to have sickness and suffer through disease and suffer through uh, mental illnesses and deal with sin because Jesus paid the price for those things. But then there's things that he did as our example. And serving, he did as our example. He didn't do that as our substitute. He didn't say, hey, I'm doing this as your substitute, and now you never have to serve again because I'm doing it in your place. No, he did it as our example. We couldn't say, thank you, Mr. Jesus, for serving so I never have to serve. No, he did it as our example. He did it as our model so that we know how to serve now. Okay? So we all, you always have to be looking what Jesus did as my substitute and what he did as my example. Because some people are thinking that they're suffering through things that, no, Jesus already took care of that as your substitute. You don't have to put up with that. But then there's things that, no, he did as our example, that we're to follow that example. And none of us have graduated beyond the example of Jesus. None of us have graduated beyond, and we're just at a certain level that I don't have to serve anymore. That is beneath me now. No. If Jesus didn't do it, why would you think that you don't have to do it? Right? I don't know if I said that wrong. If Jesus served, why would we think we wouldn't have to serve? Amen? No, let me give you an example of Jesus 
serving. In John 13, you don't have to turn there, but John 13 and verse 12, uh, this is the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. It says, when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Not blessed if you know about them, blessed if you do them. So think about this. Jesus is lowering himself to wash their feet. He is their teacher. He is their master and Lord. But yet he doesn't think that this is beneath him. He is humble enough to say, this is not beneath me. I can serve you by washing your feet. And he says, go and do likewise. Now, this is, you know, you got to understand the culture. He's not telling us that we all need to pull off our socks and shoes and start washing everybody's feet. But there needs to be nothing that is beneath us that we say, I can do that. You need somebody cleaning the toilets? I can do that. You need somebody sweeping the floors? There's nothing beneath me. Think about the time and day that Jesus lived in. I mean, they're walking around dusty, you know. They didn't have concrete and stuff like we have. I mean, there's probably donkey manure and all kind of camel stuff. And these guys are walking around sandals and what's going on? They're stepping and stuff. And Jesus lowers himself and says, let me wash your feet. Let me clean your feet. And he says, just like I have done, you go and do likewise. Wow. Somebody say, Jesus is worth my service. See, nothing is beyond our, you know, we're not too high. We didn't get to a place in our lives where, hey, I don't have to do that anymore. I've graduated. And now, you know, I don't serve in that way anymore. No. If Jesus served that way, we serve that way. He is our example. He is our model. And the thing is, is that we have to renew our mind and we have to grow spiritually to think like Jesus thinks. When you grow spiritually, amen? Amen. It's a little bit too quiet in here. I'm teaching good now. (laughs) But the Holy Spirit, when you are growing in the things of God, you become less and others become greater. What you need becomes less. You know, think about it naturally. There are babies, there are infants, there are toddlers, there's children, teenagers. And all through that development, what is happening is they are weaning themselves off their parents. They are are getting weaned off their parents. A baby, all they're focused on is what they need, right? They're not concerned if it inconveniences you from your sleep in the middle of the night. If they're uncomfortable because they got a gooey diaper, they don't care if it inconveniences you. They're going to let you know. They're going to and let you know. They're only focused on their comfort at the moment. And that's normal. That's fine because they're a baby. But if they're doing that when they're 12 years old, then that's a problem, right? Because, no, you should be learning to take care of yourself now. You should be learning that, no, you don't interrupt us anymore. You don't just think about yourself anymore. You think about somebody else. And that happens all throughout life, right? You, you grow up. You get married. So your life is not just thinking about what I want anymore. No, your life becomes the victim now to somebody else's life. You sacrifice the things that you want to do now. Hey, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go to eat? How can I be a blessing to you? You become the victim now, and somebody else is elevated. You have children. What happens? You even become less than you were before. You, your life, your needs really take a back seat now because now I care about other people. Do you see that? And when we're maturing, what happens? You are thinking of yourself less, and you are thinking of others more. That's what true spiritual maturity is. When you grow in love, you are growing spiritually. When you're growing in love for other people, 
That's how you grow spiritually. You are saying, man, I want to be a blessing to them. You're not just at home thinking, how can I bless myself? (laughs) How can I entertain myself more? How can I self-indulge more? No, you're thinking, how can I be a blessing to somebody else today? Amen? Amen? That's what growing spiritually is. Grow to, go to, grow, <laughs> yeah. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. A good indicator that we are growing up spiritually is that we start caring about other people's needs and we stop caring about our needs as much. That's a true indicator that we're growing up spiritually. When we're on our own minds less and less and we're thinking about somebody else, how can I be a blessing to them? How can I help them? How can I aid them? How can I assist them? That's true spirituality. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 1, it says, You therefore, my son... Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Did you hear that? Is everyone, let me ask you guys a question though, is everyone, every Christian in the army of the Lord? Every, I only heard a couple of answers. Is every Christian in the army of the Lord? Some of you seem scared. Is every Christian in the army of the Lord? Yes. Yes, every Christian is in the army of the Lord. How many of you know throughout the scriptures, throughout the Bible, there's, there's military terminology? Amen? There's military terminology. We just read it here. Endure hardness as a good soldier. The Bible talks about no one goes to warfare at his own charge. The Bible talks about, it uses phrases and words like, thanks be to God who gives us the victory. What is that? That's war. That's warfare terminology. We are in war there we are soldiers in the army of the lord so if you agree that we're all soldiers in the army of the lord it's not just a few people that are enlisted we're all enlisted in the army of the lord okay i'm glad you agree with that <laughs> i'm glad you agree let me let me show you another translation or read a couple of translations and i want you to see the contrast here in the mev the modern english version It says, no soldier on active duty, somebody say active duty, duty. entangles himself with civilian affairs, say civilian affairs, affairs. that he may please the enlisting officer. The NASB says, no soldier in active service, somebody say active active service, entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life, say everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him. Notice the contrast. The contrast between active service, active duty, and then civilian life, everyday life. There is a contrast. It's a completely different way of thinking. It's a completely different way of living. It's a complete lifestyle change. Amen? Amen. You know, when a person enlists in the military and... You know, they, they leave, they say goodbye to their family, they get there, and if they thought, hey, all I'm doing is putting on a uniform, and I walk around and look important, and I just get to sit back and do what I want to do, well, they're in for a rude awakening, amen? amen. No, there is a different demand now. Yes. There is a different schedule. Yes. There is a different life you are to live now. Right. And this is the life that is supposed to be for every child of God. You are not just civilian anymore. You are to live a life of active service and active duty to the Lord. There are not to be any reserve soldiers. There's not to be any part-time soldiers. Everybody should be doing something in the house of the Lord. Everybody should be doing something in the army of the Lord. 
Amen. There's a, it's, a, it's a contrast. Do you see that? We're not, we're not entangled in everyday life. So what happens is you have to die. There should be regular occasions that everyday life becomes victim to serving the Lord. Everyday life, civilian affairs become victim to serving the Lord. We sacrifice that and say, no, I got to get to the house of the Lord. I got to serve my brother and sister. Oh, what, what? They need cleaning. They need help at the church. I better get there. I better serve because I'm in active duty now. I'm in the army of the Lord now. I'm not just civilian. I don't just sit back and say, hey, freedom to just do what I want. Let others serve me. And I'm just going to sit back at home. And no, no, that we are active duty now. We're active duty now. Amen. <laughs> I'm laughing because, you know, I'm not going to be scared to talk about what's in the Bible. Amen. I'm not going to be scared to preach the word of God. Because, you know, a lot of churches, they don't talk about stuff like this. They just, they'll just say things that, hey, grace, and you're forgiven, and you are forgiven, and you can do whatever you want, but your life won't be fruitful, and you won't be useful to the kingdom of God. You know, if you want to be useful to the kingdom of God, you got to get up and serve the Lord, amen? You got to do something. The Lord, you know, the Lord is not looking for part-time soldiers, you, no more than you're looking for a part-time God, right? You're not looking for a God on reserve duty, right? No. Well, he's not looking for soldiers on reserve duty. He's not looking for part-time soldiers. He's looking for soldiers that say, I'm getting up. I'm going to do the Lord's work. Amen? No, we want a full-time commander-in-chief. Amen? And who is called to serve again? Who is in the army? All of us, all of us are called. You know, I'm not, I'm not more called to serve than you are. I'm not more, I may be called more called to preach and teach the word of God, but I'm not more called to serve than you are. We are all called to serve. We all have our service, and that's what makes us fruitful to the kingdom of God. And so the question is, when the Lord places you in a military unit, this is a military unit. Yes. This is a military unit in Bradenton, in Bradenton, Florida. The Lord has strategically placed us here yes. in this region, yes. in southwest Florida. Yes. He has placed One Way Family Church here as a strategic military unit. Yes. Should everybody be serving in their military unit? Yes. Everybody should be doing something in their military unit. Amen. Everybody should be, hey, wh what can I do this Sunday? How can I help out? What do you need me to do? Amen? Yes. Amen. And what does that do when you are serving in your military unit that the Lord has stationed you in? That relieves other people as well. That helps other people as well. That blesses, other, that blesses your brothers and sisters. And that says, I care about you. I love you. Amen. I, I want you to get a break. Here, I'm going to serve this Sunday. You serve last Sunday, I'm going to serve this Sunday. I'm going to give you a break. I love you. By love, we serve one another. Do you see that? And the, and the, the strategic military unit, the church, yes, we're a family, but it's a military unit. The success of that military unit can only be as successful as the participants, the soldiers, are on active duty, are in active service. If they're just wanting to be served, well, then, hey, it's not going to be a successful military unit, right? But if everybody gets boots on the ground and everybody straps up and says, hey, what can we do today, commander in chief? What, what, what do you need us to do? Then, hey, things get accomplished. Growth occurs, you know? And this is how the, this is the way it's supposed to be in the local church when uh, if, if the pastor is doing everything, if he's, you know, if we had grass, if he was cutting the grass, if he's cleaning, sweeping, the word level is just not going to be as good as it's, as it's supposed to. He's not going to be focused. The vision is not going to be there. The anointing's not going to be there. It's just not. And that's why there is a lot of churches that the word level is not there because the pastor, they're like, oh, we have a good pastor. He's doing everything. Yeah, but he's not doing the main thing he should be doing, which is preparing the word and feeding the sheep. That's the main thing he's supposed to be doing. That's the number one thing he's supposed to be doing, getting revelation, getting vision for the family. 
Because we are all soldiers. We all are on the team serving the Lord. We all have active responsibility and active duty. And like I said, that takes stress off the people. And I can go to many scriptures about this. Um, But let me just read this in Philippians 2. And uh, verse, I'll start in verse 25, Philippians 2. It says this, I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Notice that he's telling this Philippian church, he came close to death because of your lack of service. I mean, you know, we don't want that to be said about us. We don't want that to be said, man, so-and-so, they got sick because they're here every Sunday and other people aren't stepping up. No, let that not be said about us. Amen? We don't want that to be said that, man, so-and-so, man, they almost died. But that's also a commendation for this Epaphroditus that he was willing to sacrifice. He was willing to serve. But it's also a, a, a ammunition against this other people, this church here, because they weren't holding up their end. You see that? See, when we're serving together, it's a blessing to our brother and sister. It's an encouragement to them. Amen? And our heart's desire is that people don't get stressed out like this, that people are able to have, a, have weekends off from serving. They can come and just be served because other people are stepping up saying, hey, I'm coming, I'm coming this uh, week to serve. Amen. I'm coming. I'll, I'll do the lint rollers. I'll clean the bathrooms. I'll do these things. And we have a rotation going and that relieves our brother and sister. Do you see that? Yes. That helps them. And we're serving one another. And it communicates that you honor your brother and sister. It communicates that I love you. And so here, I'm going to take the weight off of you. Now, you may say, oh, I, I'm not physically able to do this or I can't do this. Yes. Well, there's something we could do, right? There's something that each and every one of us can do. Can you shake a hand? Can you do? There's something. Can you say hi? Can you put a smile on your face? Some of us, all of us can do something for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 6 says this. So then, as an, I'm reading from the Amplified Classic. So then, as occasion and opportunity open up to us, let us do good morally to all people not only being useful or profitable to them, but also doing what is for their spiritual good and advantage. Be mindful to be a blessing, especially to those of the household of faith, those who belong to God's family with you, the believers. You see that? We're thinking, we're being mindful of our brothers and sisters. How can I be a blessing to you? And look, there's no, I understand that some of these things just don't, don't get taught places, but they need to be taught. They need to be taught because, you know, in a lot of churches, you got a handful of people doing everything and people are overworked and they're stressed. And no, we're all in a service. We can all be a blessing to one another. Amen. We can all help one another. And when you do that, you are saying, Lord, I worship you. I'm dying to what I want to do. Yeah, I like it to sit in, you know, my lanai and have that extra hour of coffee. But you know what? I'm dying to that. That's the victim. Die. Boom. And I'm coming to you. I'm coming to serve, Lord. I'm coming to worship you. I'm coming to prepare the place so that others are ministered to, so that others get relieved, so others get edified. Do you see that? And the Lord receives that as worship. He receives that as spiritual worship. It pleases him. It pleases him just as much as you would say, oh, Lord, I love you. And you're on your knees when you're sweeping the floor, when you're doing something like that. He receives it as long as you're doing it unto the Lord and you're ministering to his people. He receives it as worship. Amen. Amen. And this is how you and I, our lives become fruitful in the kingdom of God. 
I can read in Titus where he talks about that we have fruitful lives, that we don't be unproductive, but we live fruitful lives. Amen? Amen. Active soldiers are fruitful. Active soldiers on active duty do their service. Amen? Amen. They do their tour of duty because nothing's beneath them. And when do you stop doing your tour of duty? Until the Lord Jesus comes back. Amen? Amen? There's something we could do. Amen? Oh, glory to God. Well, why don't you guys stand up with me? We hope this message has encouraged you today. For more information on our ministry or to donate, visit onewayministries.net.